everybody, my name is Drew and I am a psychotherapist here in New York City. And today we are going to do an overview of the eights, the Enneagram eights, so that we can help you eights look at your compulsions and obsessions and learn about the good stuff you've got and the stuff that gets in the way. And that's what the Enneagram does so well. It's, it's so s s revealing of the self. And I know it's tough for you eights to look at yourself and be reflective. You want to just move towards the future because you're part of the future category group. The threes, the sevens, the eights, they're, they're looking at the future, so they're the least likely to be reflective. Actually, the eights and the sevens are probably the least likely to get into therapy, for example. <clears throat> so I'm going to challenge you now. I'm going to do a deep dive. This is going to be a long one. I hope to make it fun. I'm going to throw some music in there, maybe a, a bit of a soundtrack or a playlist of the five, uh, the eight qualities that you guys have and eight struggles that you guys have. So there'll be eight songs and I'm going to challenge you to just go all the way with this. And I know as a person who knows eights well, if I challenge them, they might actually say, screw you, just because you told me to do it. I'm not going to do it. But they might also do it just because I said that they might not be able to do it. And that's the beauty of you guys is you're very complex in a kind of simple way. Like you just get shit done and move straight forward and, and grind. But that can also get in your way. So my goal is to help you feel understood, known, and seen. My joy in life is to help people understand things about themselves they didn't know they wanted to know. So in my own life, I have uh, some relatives that are eights. I have tons of clients that are eights. Surprisingly, um, I do get a lot of eights, but it's probably because I'm just a bit more bold and active as a therapist. And so a lot of eights need pushback. They need some, somebody to like uh, be able to have enough gravitas to push them forward, but also help them be reflective and slow down. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I am a sexual four. Now, interestingly, in the Enneagram world, the sexual four, and the sexual is a subtype, just if you don't know anything about the Enneagram yet, and this is new to you, there's subtypes. Now, I'm going to do a video on each subtype or, or package them together. That's 201. This is a 101 class. The real stuff is the subtypes. It's the beauty of the Enneagram to me. It's this next layer that really helps you identify what kind of eight you are. But I am, there's, a, there's three subtypes. I am a sexual or one-on-one -on -one four. And in the Enneagram world, they're considered the most feisty or hostile out of all of the types. Now, the eights in general are considered the most hostile. But the difference with a, a sexual four is I have emotional range in a different way than you do. And I'm a studier of humans in a different way than you do. The eights study the humans so they can get them to do things for them, to get the job done. I study humans because some of it's self-protective, and some of it's because I just want to go to the deepest parts of the emotional world. So when someone hurts me, I kind of know a lot about them emotionally. I might know what their uh, issues with their parents are, or their boyfriends, or girlfriends, or wives, or husbands, or whatever kind of non-binary relationship they're in. And I can call that out if I really get hurt. So it can be ruthless. And it's also why I love the eights. I identify so much with you guys because there is a feistiness that I cannot restrain at times. There's only a little bit different between us. So while you guys are the least reflective, hopefully you can hear from a sexual four who really identifies with pretty much 70 to 80 percent of what you guys both have as a skill set and a struggle and we can do this together now what i'm going to do is use uh music to hunker us down some lyrics and you'll have a little soundtrack that you can go on spotify and listen to these songs i'm not using these songs because i want to uh turn you on to this music like it's really about the lyrics but maybe it's something that you get tweaked by and go, yeah, I want to listen to a little bit more of this person or that person. And I'm going to try to use some things that are pretty universal, music, musicians that are universal. But think about music, for example. It really connects, I think, to the eight spirit. Like some of my favorite photos of artists are, you know, like Johnny Cash with his middle finger, 
right in the camera. Uh, Iggy Pop with his chest out at a concert. You know, these, these moments where the rebel spirit comes out. And when it's overly raw and young, it's kind of cute at times, but it has to mature and grow. So if we think about the public enemies, the Rage Against the Machines, the, the Nina Simones, the Marvin Gaye's, I grew up with Conscious Rap, like Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul. They help us fundamentally structure how we see the world and how we can be bold. Now, also, for me in my own life, I, I'm, I really dig comedy. So I think of people like Jerry Seinfeld or, or Larry David that seem to have at least some qualities of an eight that there is this, like, I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to be me and I'm going to say hard things and you just have to deal with it. Maybe Dave Chappelle or Louis C.K., you know, they can get themselves in trouble and they can indulge, but they also can be a good rebel spirit for us to look at, especially like a Jerry Seinfeld who, who has found ways to harness and structure what he does and the feist he uses. Okay, so we're going to get into the first song right here. Come with me. Please subscribe if you're into this. And if you're looking to get individual help, uh, whether that be short term or long term, holler at me. My stuff will come up throughout this and you're going to find ways to contact me if you need to. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Let's get into the first song. All right. Let's start on the right note by praising you guys for something great that you do. Now, when we're talking about the Enneagram, we're always looking at a lot of the negative stuff, and that's what a lot of this is gonna be. I'm kind of shitting on you a little bit, but trust me, I do this on all the numbers, especially mine, that we have to dig into the shadowy stuff that we try not to either look at or we don't want to integrate, we don't want other people to see. But this part of you, with some uh, exceptions, is great. You guys stand in the gap for those who need a person to stand in the gap. And for that, you have to have a resistance to being pushed around. So first song is by Tom Petty, I, want, I Won't Back Down. So here's some lyrics. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down going to stand my ground. And later he says, hey, baby, there ain't no easy way out. You know, there's an identification that this is hard. Life is hard. And then he says, I just got one life. I'm going to stand my ground. So I think what you eights do so well is champion causes that need to be championed. You guys have a bit of a hero complex, and we love that about you. Right? The marginalized, the abused, the folks who need a voice, you will find them. And often not indiscriminately. There's a part of you that actually finds some causes that you're really interested in. And you push towards rectifying wrongs. That's awesome. Now what can happen is, because you're so feisty, because you're so um, commanding in a room, and, and often brash and honest, you can look like or be experienced or actually be, depending on your health level. And when we're talking about the Enneagram, we're always talking about a spectrum of health, from unhealthy to really healthy. You know, if you've been working on yourself for 20, 30 years, digging deep, reading all the right books, you know, talking to the peoples, then a lot of this is going to be things you're chipping away at. But some of the things you probably had to chip away early at as an eight is possibly bullying people or running them over, needling, you know, like just poking at people and in a sense, abusing them. You can be demanding and devaluing, even demoralizing, even though your goal is to lift people up. You might not know how people can receive what you give. So your massiveness actually can make you have a smaller impact because you're doing it in the wrong way. So these tend to be some kind of opposite tendencies, but they come in the same package because at the same time, 
we need a an explosive person who doesn't explode on people, a reactive person who doesn't react poorly, uh, a resistant person who doesn't just resist control for the sake of resisting control, an individualistic person who also can understand the heart of other people. And that's part of what you guys have to do. You guys are truth seekers and champions of cause for the quiet and the oppressed, but you have to seek also the truth in your own life. So while you stick up for the underdog and you seek justice, your crosshairs also have to be not just at the target, that your cause, but also at the parts of you that you are going to not identify and work through because you are so future oriented. Now, what can happen with an eight is they they tend to be very early on in life, and hopefully they work through this, very dualistic, black and white, right or wrong, good or bad. They're binaries that they live by. Can even put people there. You're this, you're that, you're not worth it, you are worth it, you're good, you're bad. And they have to learn how to be non-binary in a sense, non-dualistic. You won't thrive only on resistance and categorization. You have to live in the gray a little bit more. And so you eights are self-forgetting. You're a self-forgetting type. Ones, nines, eights, you know, you guys can really forget yourself. Meaning you're not identifying some of that stuff internally. So you, out of those numbers, are a can't stop person. You're always pushing towards the future, so future-oriented, that if you don't look at the gray in your own life, you won't understand the gray in other people's lives. But the cause is so important. Let me read this John Steinbeck quote to you. It's a beautiful quote, I think, that you'll identify with as a freedom fighter, as a, a soul defender. There is a great tension in the world. Tension towards a breaking point. And men are unhappy and confused. At such a time, it seems natural and good to me to ask myself these questions. What do I believe in? What must I fight for? And what must I fight against? When you eights are in a good place, secure, working on yourself a bit, you look a little like a two. Now, we, we call this the high side and the low side of the eight. All the numbers have a high side and low side. In the high side, when they are not stressed, when they are in a healthy place, when they are secure, they look like a little bit of a version of another number. And for you guys, when you're in the high side, when you are not stressed out, you look like a two, a little bit. You are softer <laughs> and not weak more tender. Uh, you are a bit more okay with being needed. You're not going to get super frustrated with everybody for needing you, but also not codependent. You're going to have boundaries. You will strive to attach and actually even depend on friends or loved ones. Now, the five, which is your low side when you're in stretch, detaches a bit. They want to flee and go into their own zone and hide away. The two, when they're healthy, they ask to be appreciated for some things that they are doing well, for the empathy they give, for the sympathy and compassion they uh, procure. They can be more vulnerable than you guys. They don't need to use their power as a primary solution to their fear or their anxiety. You guys need to use power to feel safe. You don't want to feel unsafe in the world. You don't want to feel controlled. So you seek power. Now the low side, you know, when you are in a bad place, um, like the two, you might want to be flattered. You might be a bit codependent, taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. That gets in the way of the bigger mission. Now on a low side, when you're stressed out or you're, or you're just young, and you're not really healthy emotionally, you might withdraw quite a bit from the group. You might uh, 
withdrawal rather than like moving forward like you guys are good at. Hunker down into a safe place. That's what the fives do. They'll, they'll hunker down when they're in stress. They can, yes, be careful analysis. They can investigate really well. And you need to adopt some of the healthy part of the fives. We all do. But when, watch when you're in stress. Do you retreat from the world a bit? Do you hunker down and start researching, researching, researching? I know a lot of eights that will just research things to death. And they're not admitting that there's a bit of anxiety and fear, or maybe they're just, they're admitting it, but they're not working on that anxiety or fear. They're, they're just using the substitute of over-investigation to support their system. Now, the five can be thoughtful and mindful. They can be those analysts. They can gain perspective by pulling back. And, and that's the healthy part of the five you have to work through. But don't let your analyzing and researching and investigating as you withdraw, be some kind of pseudo uh, support or faux security. Um, if you have friends that you trust, say to them maybe, hey, watch out for when I go away. <laughs> What's happening there? Am I retreating to work in, in the darkness, kind of working, working, working because I feel a bit scared? This is where you can utilize your resources and like a two, maybe find ways to get your own support. All right, on to the next song. All right, we're jumping right into it. Oh, I'm going to give you a song from The Boss. And this is about you guys being bosses. So we've got to start with Bruce Springsteen. And one of my favorite songs is I'm on Fire. And this, I think really captures the eights spirit and it has a couple lyrics i'm just going to speak the couple lyrics into your your psyche here <clears throat> that are some of my favorite lyrics in a song because i really identify with it as a sexual four and i'm sure you eights will so here it is um the song i'm on fire there's these lyrics sometimes it's like someone took a knife baby edgy and dull and cut a six inch valley through the middle of my skull. At night, I wake up with the sheets soaking wet and a freight train running through the middle of my head. Only you can cool my desire. Ooh, I'm on fire. Bruce, at his best, the song is about a target, passion, desire, an aim got you in my crosshairs and that's what the eight does so well they see something it's different than a glutton a seven it's different than just over consuming it's seeing something of quality and wanting to to grab it get it any way you can and being determined i do this series on john steinbeck and bruce springsteen together how their art intermingles and how the two share a lot of similarities. It's a five-part series. And one of the episodes I call I'm on Fire, just like this part is called I'm on Fire. And I show how pain, joy, and desire equal fire. Take the ideas from East of Eden um, and from this song, I'm on Fire, to manifest a little bit of understanding of how we can tap into it appropriately and with intentionality. Now, from the Grapes of Wrath, here's a Steinbeck quote that I think is, is helpful to ground us. Fear the time when man will not suffer and die for a concept. For this one quality is the foundation of man. And this one quality is man, distinctive in the universe. That you will fight for something. You will target something. And you eights are self-starters. You're action-oriented. You're motivated. You're blind to some of the ways in which you get in your own way. And that's the thing you need to work on. And additionally, you have to work on your innocence. Being softer and tender to yourself, the child inside of you. But we cannot deny that you have the most stamina of the numbers. And you're right next to the nine who has the least stamina. 
They have the hardest time getting going. You guys get going from the beginning. You're blunt, assertive, there's no bullshit. You go to the emotion of anger to fuel you. Even when you don't know that you are. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. Anger is a useful tool, in which we'll talk about in the next part. But you guys operate in action, get it done, and are catalysts. And that's why I love Bruce when I first went to go see him. And, and I've seen Bruce like 20 times now. And the last three shows, four shows I saw were all over four hours long. Coming off the stage maybe once. Just boom, boom, boom. Song after song after song. Sweating bullets. Middle of the summer. And just had a target. The audience. And bringing them joy with the music. Now, when you guys are vulnerable... You don't get connected to what is fueling you. You don't feel or identify the feelings. The feelings are there, they're operating, but this is part of your responsibility. Because if you are too motivated by fear and anxiety, not naming it those things, then you will oper probably be operating out of a place of chaos. Or, or I would say some kind of uh, manic state. Now, the good thing is you guys can handle chaos in a way most people can't. You carry burden. You can create order out of disorder. And that's cool. And, it, and again, this is the boss in you. You use that fire, and especially when healthy, so wisely. And you communicate very commandingly. So that people know where you stand. But if you are not in charge then who are you? And this is why it can be so difficult for them to not be in a power position. Sometimes say that, uh, well, my friend once told me that I was fierce with finesse. That as a sexual four, there's a certain finesse because of the, the emotional awareness that I have. And this isn't to tell me, it's just like, I think that sometimes you eights can be fierce with fierce <laughs> or fierce with forcefulness. Yes, when the tough gets going, the going gets tough, but also if you are constantly steamrolling and walking all over people, you're missing something. So, we love that you are fun and that you can make a good time out of anything, um, but you also can get in your own way by switching in extremes that might not be helpful to you. Of course you want it big, and it's it's something I love about you guys, and. It's a, what I love about Bruce, although I don't think he's innate. Uh, I love that he goes after the big. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing that I've found. I have a friend who I think is innate. And we were at the gym one day and talking. And, and as a kid, I was picked on and I was a late bloomer. And so I was maybe like five, seven, five, eight when I graduated high school. Like no hair on my body. It was super awkward. I had these huge nipples that... Didn't make sense to me. I found out many years later that they're called nipple knots. They're a part of puberty and they last a very short period of time. And for me, they last like a couple of years where I was putting band-aids over my nipples. Sharing too much? Okay. So I was talking to him about how as an adult, there's times when I feel very small. Like I just feel that, that same size. And he said to me, now he's 5'6". He says, I've always felt about 6'3". Always. He just feels big. And I've heard this from other eights. They just feel big, even if they're short. You'll see a lot with, with eights that they'll gravitate towards big dogs. I don't know a lot of eights that are cat people. Maybe there are. Maybe write me if there are. Um, maybe you big cat people like uh, the, the Lion King or whatever. What's that guy's name? Doesn't matter. Um... Tiger King? Tiger Guy? Whatever. You saw it on Netflix. They tend to want to be around big things with power. It doesn't intimidate them. When they walk into the room, they gravitate towards those people. Where are those people? Where are my threes and sevens and eights? Where are those big personalities? I want to rub shoulders with them. And this helps, that friction, that gravitating towards those types helps you cast even better vision. 
and influence and push better because you're getting around people who do it well also. So we, we want to actually um, embrace and applaud that future thinking, that planning. But the self-forgetful part of you doesn't live in the present enough and, and also doesn't like to look in the past too much. That's why you often aren't in therapy. Here's where it goes wrong. And I've seen this happen to almost every eight. Their body starts breaking down. Either they overdo it in exercise or they underdo exercise because they're working so hard. But a lot of them end up having medical issues that catch up with them. They burn out physically. You will pay the price in your body and you're forgetting your body. So you're part of the gut uh, area of intelligence. So your body is very important to you. You have to be monitoring it and taking a scan of it often. Gut people perceive with the body. That's where your intelligence is at. Your gut, your instincts. You approach the world through your body. I, as a four, approach it through my heart, my emotions. What am I feeling right now? Now, because of that, you'll often act before you think, and that will be your learning. You know, you're going to learn in the mix. And because of that, you're probably more reactive than proactive or, or prepping. And that's where the body can pay the price. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Maybe you go look at that. And just try to be more identifying the issues that are going on through your body and often getting a couple people in your life that you can say, hey, can you tell me when you see things going wrong? They have to be bold though, because you're probably not going to listen to them anyway. <laughs> but, but pay attention to your body as it's boiling inside that there's some things that might be off. You have the tenacity of an, of an MMA fighter, or maybe you are an MMA fighter, a boxer, a kickboxer. You, you uh, grind in your workouts. That shit ends up catching up with you. Don't, I don't know any MMA fighters or boxers that don't have significant long-term issues that they're going to have to deal with. So you are the MMA fighters of work. It's going to catch up with you. The needed revelation hopefully doesn't come when you are prone to collapse because you've just done too much and your body is an inflamed mess engulfed in all kinds of issues. So that is my plea. Don't be angry at your body in a sense, like by neglecting it. It's an act of oppression. You have to have balance. All right, on to the next. All right, so here's another Bruce song right after the last. It is Wrecking Ball. And so the, the story behind this song for me is that 2013, I went to my first Bruce concert. I grew up in Jersey. I heard about Bruce throughout my whole life, but never was into his music. And then my friend, not from Jersey, started working for him and invited me to come out backstage, all the things, and I got hooked. You know, the show was almost four hours. I saw families in front of me from 80-year-olds to babies and generations and generations who loved this music together. And there was one moment in the concert that just brought tears to my eyes. It just felt like a power coming from the stage. And, and I don't think Bruce is an eight. Maybe he is, but I... I, I have a hunch of what his number and subtype are. I won't say that here, but he played the song Wrecking Ball, which is about the Meadowlands, which is where the New York Giants, the football team, played uh, the old Meadowlands and how it was getting torn down and the new building was going to be built, the new Meadowlands for the Giants to play in, the concerts, and he had played tons of concerts at the Meadowlands. And this song hit me because it was about the grind it was about being fearless in the face of pain. It was about standing strong. And so he uses the building as a metaphor for his own life, for our lives, that we need to tap into some of the stuff that maybe the world sees as possibly scary, specifically anger. 
to push back and not be run over. So here's the lyrics. I was raised out of steel here in the swamps of New Jersey. Through the mud and the tears, the blood and the cheers, I've seen champions come and go. So if you've got the guts, mister, yeah, if you've got the balls, if you think it's your time to step to the line and bring on your wrecking ball, goes on from there, that there is going to be a, a pushback. And then he uses this refrain, which I think is very um, powerful for everyone, but specifically for you eights, I think you'll relate. This idea where he says, hold tight to your anger. Hold tight to your anger. Hold tight to your anger. And don't fall to your fears. Now you eights use your anger so well. In the Enneagram, we are, we are blocked in to three, uh, three, and three of the areas of intelligence. You guys are the gut. And in these areas of intelligence, there's also an emotion that kind of symbolizes that area of intelligence. And yours is anger. So the eights overdo anger. You know, you guys, you guys are feisties. The nines underdo anger, and the ones have a complicated relationship with anger. They kind of don't know where to be. Sort of like the twos uh, for the heart center with sadness. But Bruce is saying, use this. Identify it, call it out, name it. Don't be so quick to push back and say, no, 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 I'm not angry. Utilize it to fight your fears. And then he says this in another refrain, and hard times come and hard times go. He says it four more times, and hard times come and hard times go, and hard times come and hard times go. Yeah, just to come again. Bring on your wrecking ball. So this is called wrecking ball. We're going to get into feistiness and how to utilize it. I have, I have a little nephew. He's three years old. I swear he's going to be an eight. I, I don't want to predict it. I, I mentioned it to his parents. He just can utilize an energy and a force and a feistiness to just own a room. And he's not very afraid of, of things that come at him. It's quite interesting to see that in a little boy. So the challenge will be met by the eight. Tell them they can't do something, they will do it. It's a great, like, I love as a psychologist, if I, if I tell you, like I said in the beginning, that you're not going to watch all of this, there's a good chance you might watch all of it. Or you might push back and say, no, I won't watch all of it because I don't want to be controlled. I get it. There's both ways work for you guys and against you. But you guys choose to fight the battle. And the unconscious motivation that can get in your way is... When you try to assert your power, it's often because you want to avoid vulnerability and weakness. So I will be in charge so my weakness doesn't show. That strategy of assertion and control and power can get in the way. Now, when it's harnessed, right, um, and you are not just easily splitting the world into black and white and being dualistic and simple with the world, when you're able to live in that gray a little bit, you can actually become less of a person who's just intimidating and seen as hostile. You can be experienced less as a person who's coming as a tsunami of intensity and maybe more as a nice wave to, to, uh, to surf on. Maybe even a bigger wave than most waves, but yeah, that's okay, because you want the best surfers on that. I talked to my buddy, who I think is an eight. Uh, we still haven't decided if he's a three or an eight. It's, it's hard sometimes, but he says this. 40% of him in business is a steamroller. 40% is making up for the steamrolling, and 20% is diplomacy. Now, that might be flipped for a three. Um, but when he says something hard to somebody, he doesn't overly get consumed by it. He walks on. If he's angry and puts his anger on people, 
he can let it go. Now, as a sexual four, I know the difference between me and an eight is that I might even be more angry and more feisty than an eight. But when I walk away, there's a, na a natural shame that comes with it. It's a feeling that there's something wrong with me for even having pushed that way. Now, that's what I have to work on is pushing past that to actually be bold and uh, forgive myself and let that shed off. You know, the, the sexual fours and the eights have an interesting um, relationship in that they, the fours are way more aware of their emotional uh, depth, um, ability to be melancholy and dark. And so while we are feisty, we don't let things go as quick as you guys do. So I may wonder after a while, afterwards, what do they think? Uh, did I go too far? You guys might think the same thing, but it might haunt me for a while. And it might get in the way of the relationship because I might hold on to it and actually avoid or withdraw from that person. It's not the same need for communal recognition that you guys have. Sure, you want to be seen as worthy and powerful, but you don't have the same need uh, to be seen as unique and authentic. Now, I talk about anger and how to use anger in another uh, episode that isn't on the Enneagram. It's on Seinfeld. <laughs> so I, I do this uh, three-part episode called Seinfeld as Psychologist, who I think uses his anger really well, and maybe in eight. I'm not sure but I, I tend to think that there's some real strong eight qualities in comedians in general, as I've said before. And so I think he utilizes that anger to really um, be a force in the world without a lot of guilt, but he has found ways to harness it. So go watch that episode if you want to get deeper into how to utilize this anger. For women or folks that identify on the... Uh, on the binary spectrum somewhere, or non-binary spectrum somewhere, as having more, what would be considered feminine qualities. Uh, it is tough for you eights, because an eight is a masculine archetype. A two is a feminine archetype, the caregiver, or the challenger, if you are more on the feminine side of things is considered a bitch um, or too much. And while you are looking for justice and fairness, you may be perceived as outspoken and going too far. It shouldn't be this way. I challenge you to find the appropriate balance for you, but to be bold no matter what and to start forgiving yourself for being strong. If you're too strong and you're getting that feedback and you're running over people, you need to pull back a bit and balance it. Men and women, they and thems, okay? Um, depending on where you live, this might be harder than other places. Now, I live in New York City. Strong women are all over the place. It's a city that is built on power and pushing forward. Certain parts of the country, for example, the South, a woman is expected to be a certain way in certain environments. And so it might be very confusing and entrapping and uh, you might feel like you're a bit in a cage. Either fucking move to a place where you'll be more understood or push back on the system. But take heart, your energy, ladies and those who identify more in those uh, softer, tender parts of their, their self. Um, it is sexy, I would say. It's attractive. It is beautiful for you to be bold. So uh, I, am, I embolden you uh, for whatever that's worth. Combat and content, uh, contention is also part of our environment in politics and entertainment right now, specifically. And so it is actually magnified and indulged in. 
you guys like to spar. This climate right now is very interesting for you because you may capitalize on your contentiousness and debating style and your neglect of your emotional development because you have this environment that's so charged. Just going to challenge you also uh, to put people in their place with compassion and with empathy. Not dehumanizing and not devaluing. So that's all I have to say about it. Please, if you're going to watch something on anger, go watch that one on Seinfeld. Even if you're not in the Seinfeld, I'd really try to make it more of a broad understanding of how to utilize anger better. Okay, on to the next. All right, let's talk about the rebellion of the eight. You guys have a rebellious spirit. Social norms you want to push back on. Status quo you want to push back on. When we push too much, that behavior can become hmm, uncontrolled. Uh, you may really push back on people who tend to go with the flow of society. You might see them as weak and you might become hostile towards them. You might see them as rigid, soft, uh, lacking confidence. And so your stubbornness and hostility towards people who go with the flow might be too loud. And that's when you can be reckless, reckless with your power. And I've seen a lot of eights, especially when they're young, become rebels without causes. Now, this is the old James Dean movie. If you remember it, there's they're young folks that are, are just pushing against the system. Now, there is some reasons for their underlying anger, but they're pushing against the system in a way that isn't really harnessed. So it is the goal of the eight to be harnessed. Now, when I think of songs about rebellion, I think of Rebel Rebel by David Bowie or Billy Idol's Rebel Yell. Now, I'm going to actually use for when we talk about lust, your passion, your vice, lust, I'm going to talk about Rebel Rebel. But for uh, rebellion, I'm going to talk about Lust for Life by Iggy Pop. Now, these two, David Bowie and Iggy Pop, wrote this song together, interestingly enough. In 1977, they were sitting together watching TV, waiting for Starsky and Hutch to come on. And I think they saw a commercial for the military, or I don't think there was a military network back then, but if there was, uh, they heard a commercial. And in that commercial was a song. It's the Armed Forces Network call signal. And that is the rhythm they used for the beginning of the song. Very eight, right? Military, force, power. Now, in the beginning of that song, it is forceful and powerful. Lust for life. Now, I'm not going to go into the lyrics because some of it doesn't fit. It's a little complex. There's uh, a Burroughs book that they're referencing. But it, down the road, it really gained traction. It didn't really hit in 1977. And Iggy Pop thought it would. But it didn't really hit until Train Spotting, the movie in 1996, used it as the beginning of the film. And Boyle, the director, he used it to show that power of how heroin had taken over these characters. Go watch it. It's a great opening scene. Two minutes even if you just Google it. But Pop was interviewed later, right after the film came out. And he said this. Now, I want you to, to know, I want to use the words he actually said. I uh, hope it doesn't offend you, but it's very strong. But it, you're going to hear the rebellion. And this is in his older age, you know, probably 40s, 50s. Uh, the rebellion in his voice. Listen to this. When I made Lust for Life, I really thought America was going to rock to this motherfucker. And it took 20 fucking years, which is a really long time to wait. I guess what happened is that there was this system that wasn't going to fucking give me a break. And I outlived the system. Like the song outlived the system. This is classic. It, it, one of my favorite psychologists from the 1900s, early 1900s, is this guy Otto Rank. And he wrote this book on the artist. The psychology of the artist. In 1900, he was a young man. He wrote this book on this, the psychology of the artist. And he said, the work of the artist is the work of the rebel. They push against the collective soul and they become singular 
And that's where you guys fit in. It's like, don't tread on me. Don't threaten my territory. I will push back with disdain against constraints. And that's what Iggy Pop is talking about. Like, yeah, motherfuckers, now it's my time. 20 years later, you're finally getting it. That I was putting something quality out there and you didn't get it. You eights feel that. And, and folks who are watching that aren't eights, you have to know, like, there's good and bad to that. It's electrifying, it's eager. It's not often met with malice, but it can destroy. When we are broken, especially as eights, the world can seem pretty threatening even when it's not. And so it feels like it won't work for me. You hear it in Iggy, voices, Iggy Pop's voice, like it, it's not gonna work for me. Something's gonna happen here that is gonna go against me. Now, what can happen as a response, especially with AIDS, is that they can then become like how the world is to them. The world isn't getting you. The world is pushing back on you. So then they start pushing back. They might bully and needle. They might become combative. Most of the time, they're trying to help with how they push back on society. But often, it's just wild, like we talked about, that, that it's obviously a rebel without a cause that it doesn't have the real juice behind it. Even though they can use um, some kind of underground emotion, they're really at some level detached about what they're really feeling, which might be hurt and pain and sadness. And that can make them rough around the edges. Now, if you call them angry, often they'll say, I'm not angry, I'm just passionate, or I'm not loud, I'm just passionate. But you have to know how much of that anger is ruling you and what's below it. You know, with all of us, anger is often an easy go-to because it's just more powerful. And for people who really can't experience power, it's hard for them to tap into it. But for those who have an easy access to it, like eights, it can mask the hurt below. Now, I, I wanna talk about sexual eights. Again, I'm gonna emphasize this over and over again. This is the foundation work, the Enneagram number. The subtypes is the next level. It's the 201 classes. And so let's just briefly talk about the sexual type. Now, you're always all three. So for all of you eights, there will be some sexual one-on-one -on -one component in your life, even if, if it's your last on the triple stack. You know, it's the most muted. But... I think we can use the sexual eight here to just kind of describe the rebellion a bit more. They want to possess. I will have it. I will take it. I want you. I'm going to go after you. I want it. I'm going to go after it. That, that's kind of an open rebellion. It is a, I'm going to be here and I'm going to, no matter what, get that thing. What I do, who I am is different and I am passionate. But interestingly enough, like I was talking about, there might be a mushy underside, especially with the sexual aids. They're a bit more emotional than the other two. And so while their anger can be heightened, their frustration can be heightened, and you could feel their like dictatorship at times, often you'll see that they'll get to those lower levels too and break a bit. What we have to look for in the eights in general is what is the disconnect in early childhood? Where were they disre disrespected, abandoned, disregarded? Where did they see the world as not safe and it will go wrong? Where they said, hell no. Like that rebellious spirit, hell no. I'm not going to deal with this this way. I'm going to push back. It might be with their parent or their town, or their state, or their city, or whatever. But something made them feel unsafe, often, and they said, I will not feel unsafe again. I will get power over this situation, over this environment, over a car, over a trip, over a hotel, over whatever. Now, I'm a sexual four. I relate so much to the sexual eights, as, I, as, as I've told you before. In, I relate to the eights in general, 
Um, sp but specifically to the parts of the eight, uh, the, specifically the sexual eight, that draw people in, are magnetic, are wearing the passion so brightly. There's something uh, almost glossy about it. They penetrate. You know, the idea of that sexual type is about exalted moments, about heightened moments. It's really about a one-on-one -on -one relationship or, or a small group, but that idea of penetration, almost like sexually, that when we walk into the room, the sexual four and the sexual eight, we can penetrate, seduce you, pull you in, suck you in with our energy, with our, with our carbonation. And we can expedite intimacy. And you will see this in a lot of rebels, a lot of musicians, a lot of artists, like Bowie, like Iggy Pop. Think about Iggy Pop, he's always got his shirt off. Bowie's always, you know, maybe not in later life, but in his younger years, was, was super expressive and seductive sexually. This is a way they dominate. That's why they make good dictators. <laughs> it's also why they make good leaders. What do we have to look at here when we talk about going from your passion to a way of healing, to innocence, from lust to innocence? You have to ask yourself the question, Rebels. Do I need to be provocative in this moment? What am I rebelling against in this moment? Is it for a cause or is it because I have no cause and I'm just angry at the world? What are you fighting for here? Ask yourself, am I trying to prove something in this moment or in this season of life and to who? And this is sometimes where you'll get to the deep, psychologically juicy stuff, where you can mine and dig, go back to your origins. Ask the question there. Am I still trying to prove something to dad or mom or to my peers, to my, my coaches, to those around me that possibly didn't get it and should have? And now, am I doing this now with my middle finger? Look at young artists, uh, Instagram, just pop on Instagram and see how many people are posing with their middle finger up. What is that about? It's about saying, and it's often unconscious because they just do that. They see the, the photos of their favorite artists. The favorite one for me is Johnny Cash, just giving a middle finger like this. It's one of the best photos, but it's also like, it's young. It's a young expression of rebellion, but it's often misguided. And so you have to ask the question, who am I giving the middle finger to and why? Is there a person I'm really trying to get love from here that I didn't? And while you're spelling your cast <laughs> or casting your spell and that part of your social scheme to get love, ask yourself the question of, who am I trying to get love from? And do I need to love myself more so I don't have to be pushing back on the world so much? Okay, there's rebellion that works for us. There's a rebellion that works against us. Trying to find out how to mitigate and so that you are working for community, for a cause, is the most important part. All right, let's go on to lust, because then we're going to use this song, Rebel Rebel, and I think it will help us understand lust a bit more and the difference between lust and gluttony. So this song, Rebel Rebel, I think perfectly manifests the idea of confusing and interweaving two vices or two passions, lust and gluttony. Now we know that the seven's passion is gluttony and the eight's passion is lust, but we can confuse those two. For many people, they think they're the same thing. Or they simply think that lust is about sexuality and gluttony is about food. Well, of course, those are big components of those two, but, but let's get into this. And I think that the song confuses or mixes these worlds, and I want to use it just to root us in the complexity of these two so that we can understand lust more and how lust affects you eight's lives. Okay, 
So I'm just going to throw some lyrics at it at you, not the full lyrics and not in any order. But here it starts with this first line. You've got your mother in a whirl, doesn't know if you're a boy or a girl. Okay, so it's already the idea of, you know, uh, confusion, a little bit of rebellion right there that we were just talking about. Hey, babe, let's go out tonight. You like me and I like it all. You like bands when they're playing hard. You want more and you want it fast. And at the end, he says, the lyric goes, you've torn your dress and your face is a mess. You can't get enough, but enough ain't the test. Okay, lust, uh, finding more, intensity, often sexual. Looking for exalted moments. This is where uh, uh, the sexual type, the one-on-one -on -one type, is often looking for exalted moments. Maximizing life. To overdo. Not to over intake, but to overdo. Too much is almost enough, is a common theme for the eights. There's constant stimulation needed. Getting, expanding, inflating. I don't mean like... Uh, inflating to just be seen, but the idea of whew, inflate life, inflate my experience, they can be very reckless. Now, I want to just get into the wings real quickly. I want to talk about a hard eight wing seven. When I say a hard or a strong eight wing seven, I mean that your first number that you scored is an eight, and the second number was a seven. That's like a, a hard. Like, I'm a hard four wing three. Those were my top two scores. We all have wings. You might just be an eight wing seven, but, you know, seven doesn't register that high for you. But let's just use them as an example. They can be one of the most reckless combos out there because they are mixing gluttony and lust together. Big, big risk, big reward, big decision makers. Let's do it. Let's go for it. Forceful, dominant, uh, opinionated. They could be very social and talkative and confident. They can have an addictive personality. Now, eights and generals, you guys struggle with a lot of these. And again, we're all three number or three subtypes, and we're both wings, but we can definitely lean towards one more than the other. The eight wing seven especially might really need some strong trauma in life to work on their shit, to be more sympathetic, compassionate, empathetic, to understand what people are going through, they might have to have really been hit by life. Car wreck type of stuff emotionally. Otherwise, they can be reckless with others. Taking advantage of them. Um, getting that rush from the risk. And so to be more empathetic, they have to identify when they are in a rut. When they are in liminal space. Betwixt and between. Stuck. Hurting. Now... They could also be super enthusiastic, passionate. That's, that's great. Um, so like anything, your wing works for you and against you. But as we use them as an example to learn about lust and gluttony, think about those two com combinations together. Now, let's talk a little bit about what they are. What's lust? Lust isn't an emotion. A lot of people will say, like, lust, you're, you're emotionally, you know, you're experiencing the emotion of lust. No, it's an experience of emotions. Eights can lose track of their emotions really easy. They can, they can often go unidentified for them. So when you are really passionate, you might actually try to name your emotions. What are the emotions underlying? What's, what emotions go into relentlessness? Can you experience them? Gluttony uh, is the idea that once I gotten it, I want more of it. I can't just have one. I should have oversatisfaction, unconstrained consumption. Think of it, my friend always talks about Doritos, like they're made so that you just can't eat one. You just want to keep on eating and eating. And so that's where we get this idea of, of food for uh, gluttons is that they, they can't stop. 
their stomach will expand metaphorically and sometimes literally. Lust is different in that you see a target and you will get it. It's more based on focus and pleasure, strong desire, where the glutton is not going to savor um, and their consuming can be very costly to them, maybe to the environment. The lustful person has a target and when they get it, there will be pleasure in it. That might be good enough for them to get it. They're going to be big in it and really enjoy it, but they have a target. It's a thirst for that thing. And the reason it's a vice is because when you have a target like that and you are not constrained or you are unhealthy or you are young, you might do anything to get that. You might compromise yourself. You might compromise others. Because even in many cases, it's because you're going after something that's not yours to have. When we are wild in our lust, we are often targeting things that aren't meant for us. So you might not see the humans or the emotions behind the target, especially when it's a human. If it's just the thing you're going after, well, you might have to take out humans to get that thing. Maybe it costs a lot of money and you have to run over people to get that money. So we have to you know, engage our discernment and our awareness of self when we have targets in that pursuit. Otherwise, it will reduce us. Now, the glutton is indiscriminate. It's not as targeted. Uh, it's self-indulgence for self-indulgence sake. So it reduces you to being lost in the immersion in that moment. It might not actually affect the other humans as much where the lusting can. But when you're lost in that immersion, you're losing yourself, gluttons. Now, self-indulgence reduces you. So where the lust can often hurt others, the glutton is often hurting themselves. Now, of course, that the byproducts of that is it hurts other people. You know, if you're, if you're a glutton for drugs and alcohol, and food, you're going to be affecting your friends, your family, obviously. With lust, it's also a desire to control others. Um, it's a people-oriented experience. So yes, you might be going after material things, but often that's going to require you to engage humans. And to do that, you might have to run over them. So where gluttony is over consumption, um, lust can be controlling by desiring something and, and possibly more future oriented. I mean, it almost has to be. While sevens and eights are both future oriented thinkers, the lustful person, the eight, is a bit more targeted in their future orientation. Where uh, the seven might just be using future like, you know, uh, exciting things and filling themselves with things to fill that hole. Um, so we, we, we have to concentrate on how future oriented do you push out you eights? How do you miss the now? Because your target is so deeply embedded in you and, and you're passionate and desiring it so uh, deeply that you miss the now. We could it, maybe make these useful um, categorizations here. I think when we're talking about gluttony, it's more inward directed. It's more filling the hole. And we're always filling the hole, but it literally might be filling the hole and not being able to stop filling the hole. The lustful person, the eight, seems to be more outwardly directed. It's about a target out there. So, where the glutton might more easily hurt themselves, the lustful person, the eight, might more easily be hurting others. It's also the difference between quality and quantity. Quality is an eight thing. I want that thing because I really like that thing, and I want to go get that thing. I want to possess that. 
where quantity might be more of the glutton's issue. Just, I'll just take, I'll just keep on putting it in there. Um, that sensual experience is different than that pleasure oriented experience. I want the, I'll wait for the pleasure. I just, the other one just wants sensuality just coming at them. Uh, it, in that sense, it's kind of like the most versus the best. You know, think about it that way. Um, think about adultery, for example. The difference between somebody wanting to sleep with anyone and somebody having a specific target. They're taking something that's not theirs, but one is just about consumption. I'll just, I'll hook up with anything. And one's about, I like that. I'm going to go after that. I have an obsession. You know, my obsession is towards that thing. Different than just being insatiable. How can an eight diminish the negative effects of lust? The negative effects of their passion? Well, I think sometimes, like uh, Iggy Pop had to experience in his, ex his music, that it took 20 years to get some satisfaction. Now, seemingly, he didn't handle it totally well because he's still so upset. That's kind of how he talks, too. But the waiting, the being patient, the not getting something very quickly, to being very deliberate and discerning about how you'll go after that. And so sometimes how the world makes you wait will actually help you. And I'm sure at some level it did help Iggy. But Iggy is naturally that kind of eight, I think, that there's a great picture of him, and, and we'll, we'll use it right now, okay? It's going to come over here or here. He puts his chest out. I think he was kind of surfing a crowd, and he puts his chest out like this. That is the eight. They're so in the future that they're missing what's going on around them, and they need pause. I'm going to go into that later, but it is something helpful for the lust that we have. You can also think about the eight-wing nine. So let's just talk about them real quickly. It's very confusing because you've got this peacemaker with this confronter. And so for people watching, you know, they get really confused by eight wings nines, but they're less reckless. They actually can, the nine part can kind of fix or ease the recklessness. They can be more eight wing nines direct and opinionated, but diplomatic. They can be grounded with their control, more methodical and thoughtful can make you be in your place, but they have controls around themselves about how they will put you in your place or how they will use you, how they will uh, not even waver, but it will be more controlled. So they may still dominate and collect and possess, but they have that peace component in their personal life. And so the eight wing seven or the the unhealthy, lustful eight can engage that nine part. I think also um, just growing older. Now, Iggy Pop was probably in his 40s when that experience with train spotting happened. So I want you to think about Carl Jung's words as we, we end this. He says about the libido, about the will, drive. But it becomes less sexual in time, less intense in time. Like we literally, our libido slows down. I know mine has, I'm 43 right now. My libido has slowed down. My aggressive tendencies have diminished. And he says this, in the first half of life, your first 40 years, the libido's will is for growth. Expansion, as I said. Lust is about expanding. In the second half of life, it hints softly at first and then audibly, it gets louder, at its will for death. What we mean here, 
and what Carl Jung means. Yes, literal death. Possibly when you're 80s, you know, the next 40 years. But the death of how you misuse and your targeting is misguided. Okay? Let's take a break here for a second and just breathe in. And we'll move on to the next song and the next part. All right, I want to follow up that piece with another Kate Bush song. And this is going to be a little tricky if you're reading the lyrics, because there's something I'm trying to give a message about here that's a little layered. The song is called Hounds of Love. So let me just read the lyrics and I'll tell you what I'm trying to get across here. It's in the trees, it's coming. When I was a child running in the night, afraid of what might be, hiding in the dark, hiding in the street, and of what was following me. Now hounds of love are hunting. I'm gonna repeat that. Now hounds of love are hunting. I've always been a coward, and I don't know what's good for me. It's coming for me through the trees. I need love. Okay. What I'm trying to get across here is that to love well, you need love. You need to be loved well. And where the origins of great love towards us is found is in the word grace. When we are given the gift of love, not because we deserve it, just because we are. And so for the eight to appreciate being loved will help them love others. And so you must know that the hounds of love are on the beat of your path. They are coming for you. At some point, life will hit you hard. And you'll probably be able to handle it pretty well. But sometimes you get a little crack in, the, in, in some crevices and love will come in and soften you up a bit. So this is a bit on the heels of the last one. But I want you to think of the Hounds of Love in a couple ways. So this one's about self-care in a way, and we're going to compound on self-care as we move forward. But one is that you guys can be assholes. Somebody could say something wrong and you give them that face, that look of disgust. You can demonize others. You can judge others. You might be the most demonizing and judging of all of the numbers. You might shame other people and diminish them. Now you are probably picking up on problems appropriately, but your disdain, your um, oppressive kind of stance towards it is something that kind of can be massive. And that part can overwhelm others. And that is the thing you have to work on. And so we need grace for that. We need grace to, to defend us against being a dick or an asshole. What is grace? Grace is the unmerited favor towards people don't deserve it. Now, this is a spiritual term for the most part. The idea that uh, the universe or God um, in the Christian world, uh, Jesus coming to give us the gift of full life because not that we've done everything right, but just because we are. And how can we take that spiritual imperative and utilize it in our own life? It doesn't require you to compromise your beliefs or how you do things that are appropriate for the betterment of this world. It does not mean blind reconciliation. It doesn't mean getting taken advantage of. It doesn't mean avoiding conflict. It actually means having healthy conflict, understanding others and what place they're coming for. And that's about empathy, not sympathy. Empathy is having kind of a deep understanding of the hurts and struggles of other people of having humility. I do not mean being soft and quiet. 
humility has gotten a bad rap in my in my life i don't like the word humility too much at times because it's it's used improperly we give the word humility to people who are just like going with the status quo or or not making enough noise or they're they're being sweet they're being meek but meekness can actually mean something more like taming a mustang to bring it under control and so when i use the word humility i mean coming close to the ground hummus is the root there dirt and that means knowing who you are your true self the good the bad and the ugly and your true self might be a leader might be strong might be powerful that might actually offend a lot of people but it is being humble but when it's broad and uh, integrated it understands that other people have some bits about them that we might not like that we have to have grace for them for it means being a peacemaker, not a uh, peacekeeper, but make peace. Everyone's backstory is complicated. As a therapist, I have clients who walk in and I might not hear a part of their story for two years. They're hiding it or holding it or saving it or not ready, like that last song we talked about. And, and in that, we don't know what people have been through. And the eight can miss people because of that. So if you are growing in grace, I think eight, you will also grow in the diversity of those who you keep around you. And even in leadership, how you use them that you will actually find ways to use people that you didn't think you would because you saw them as slow or incompetent or whatever, but you're finding their gifts because you're understanding more about humans. You have a predilection towards binary thinking, towards black and white thinking, of just putting people in categories. And there has to be a gray world that you live in and you are moving towards. Otherwise you will be diminishing and get bored by people that are actually pretty interesting and layered. How do we do this? Okay, here, let me give you a couple tips, and these are hard. Uh, you've probably heard it that most of life's troubles come from men not being able to be alone by themselves. That's a quote, I, I want to say it's uh, Thoreau, but the idea that people, humans, have a difficult time being alone by themselves. I I'll challenge clients who are eights to go sit in a closet for an hour or two with nothing just lights off see what comes up or wouldn't you rather just push forward future oriented get the hell out of that closet i gotta do stuff i gotta move forward we need to get some solitude here's a quote by balzac uh solitude is fine but you need someone to tell you that solitude is fine. Now I'm telling you solitude is fine. One of my favorite books of all time. Look how short this is, eight. You don't have to read much. You don't have to get too deep. It's nine letters written by Rainer Marie Rocco, my favorite poet. I don't really read poetry. I don't even read his poetry. I read his other stuff. But anyway, in this book, there was a young poet around 1900 who was writing him. And, and Rocco was a famous poet. And he was asking him how to be a better poet. And Rilke kept on pushing him to go towards solitude, to understand yourself more deeply, to understand your emotional range. It's you time. Listen to your body. Listen to your heart. Listen to your mind. All three centers of intelligence that you can utilize in solitude. Aids don't want to sit in solitude or silence for too long because it will bring up stuff that will make them re remember how life is hard. And they might even start to remember how they've trampled on people, how they've hurt people, how they impacted folks. So in solitude, you can go to the good, bad, and ugly. And you might need to do this in a tapered way, you know, or, or like a progressive way, maybe a 10 minute time and then 20, and maybe you get to that hour. And meditation will help too if you choose to do that. 
I'm going to give you a video to watch also, or not a video, a, a YouTube, um, the audio will be there, but a commencement speech by one of my favorite writers, David Foster Wallace, who ultimately ended up killing himself in his 40s, unfortunately, brilliant mind. And he gave a commencement speech at Kenyon College, and it was called This Is Water. Go listen to that. It's a very strong uh, movement towards grace from a very powerful person. And he says this in that speech. Learning how to think really means learning how to exercise control over how and what you think. Because if you cannot or will not exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. And what he talks about is understanding that other people are in places and you don't understand what they're going through. And what looks like disregard for you might actually be hurt for them. So we must practice patience. Eights tend to concentrate and deliberate about what's out there, what's going on, what's in the future. They can distract themselves and avoid the attention to the complicated stuff inside by using fix-it goals and setting goals and plans. You've got to be more patient with yourself. Let the hounds of love chase you so that you love yourself more. It has to start there. And that's what Kate Bush says at the end of that song, Hounds of Love. I need love. You wouldn't even ask the questions of yourself, ultimately, if hunt, love didn't hunt you down in whatever way love hunts you down. For a four like me, I'm going to be asking these questions of myself all the time. You know, I want to know all the deep corners of my soul. Also, ask yourself this. Will it give you strength and even more honest control if you're going to be uh, candid with yourself? to go deep. It will. It will make your career better. It will make your relationships better. It'll be hard at first. So patience in your persistence. Even if there's a moment where you're completely wrong, get that feedback and then go into solitude or silence to figure out what am I doing here? What am I missing? Yes, you guys can be steamrollers. You can walk all over people. You can get away with things. Um, but can you use a bit of that grit to look at yourself and understand in those spaces how you could be more whole? All right. That's enough with Kate Bush. Hounds of Love. Actually, another version of it's by uh, the Future Heads. It's a really kind of fun but layered song. All right, next. All right, folks, we are going to now talk about innocence. Yeah, I know. I know this is a tougher one. This is one where you have to tap into that softer side of yourself, eights. Feel the mushiness. This is also probably my favorite part here because as a therapist, I've worked with eights my whole career. Before I knew the Enneagram, I didn't know I was working with eights. I just thought I was working with some really tough clients. Also some really fun clients, because when an eight really gets into it, they can be obsessed about the therapy. But I've seen eights be very tender, very soft. And when they, when they actually get in touch with the child inside of them, the kid inside of them, they can see the most growth. And some of my work has actually been to help them talk to the kid. Where was that kid hurt at? What age? And go back and talk to that child as a parent would. The parenting they'd have wanted. And they tend to be much softer and gentler with that child. And therefore they can be softer and gentler with themselves and softer and gentler with other people. I've been on a kick listening to Kate Bush, British singer. I don't know how old she is now, maybe in her 50s, 60s, um, possibly 70s, I don't know. I've gotten on this little kick and, and she's really creative. She started singing when she was around 11 and then uh, uh, I think 
one of the guys in Pink Floyd discovered her at 16 and helped her get a record deal. And she became this huge hit. She has some really unique songs that are actually in line with a lot of what I think eights do well. Pushing against how other people have sang, how other people write. So very stylistically unorthodox. And so I wanted to use her here. And I'm going to use another song too to, to help us in another part. But listen to these lyrics. Okay, This song is called Love and Anger. It lay buried here. It lay deep inside. It's so deep, I don't think that I can speak about it. It could take me all my life. But it would only take a moment to tell you what I'm feeling. But I don't know if I'm ready yet. Take away the love and the anger. Looking for a moment that'll never happen. Living in the gap between past and future. Take away the stone and the timber. Let's just take those last two lines. Take away the stone and the timber, the hard parts of us. Those things that we are rock solid inside and we will not be wavered. We will not be moved. We will not be pushed. Take that stuff away for a little bit. Now let's get to that lyric before. Living in the gap between past and future. A lot of eight's past is something that they are disregarding the weight of. But there are things in their past that they feel really shamed about, possibly guilty about, hurt by, that they haven't told many people, if many at all. Maybe no one. Some of these things, as a therapist, they tell me and I go, really? That was it? Because they've built this thing up to be so big that if they would have just told somebody way back, they would have gotten through it with a lot of healing. So a lot of my clients, when they've finally come out with some of the things in their past, it was super cathartic for them, but also a revelation that, wow, if I had done this a long time ago, but they didn't know if they were ready, right? That they would have had some healing. But because they've become grizzled and hard and timbered, solid, stoned, they have not been able to reveal. So you often hear throughout the Enneagram content that there is this underbelly of tenderness, of vulnerability. That yes, they are assertive and often heavy, but soft underneath. That there is a very strong capacity for compassion, empathy. But it's hidden behind a lot of their works. So that tender-hearted side only gets to be revealed every once in a while, and often they're caught off guard when it happens. Also, eights feel misunderstood. Like, they won't be gotten. They won't be understood. I hear this from my eight clients all the time. Like, they don't get it. They don't get me. Uh, I won't be understood if I share such and such. They can't handle me. If you are going to grow up, you're going to have to realize people can handle more than you think they can. But because a lot of eights have grown up in such a way in which they felt like they didn't have control of their environment, they have reacted with taking control of their environment. But there is still that softer piece underneath. Now, I know this because it's true in my life as a sexual four, that when I feel hurted, hurted, hurted by someone, <laughs> when somebody hurts me, often my first instinct is to feel my anger. It's just a safer, more powerful position to be in. If I do the work and go, what's the secondary emotion, which is actually probably the primary emotion I'm trying to protect myself from, it's sadness. We have to look for the loss of innocence in our early life. Where was your trust broken? Where were you abandoned? Where were you neglected? Where were you not seen? I tell you in the beginning of all of my pieces that I want the people who watch these to feel seen and known and understood. But we have to be vulnerable to get that. 
So when we compensate by becoming too strong, and sometimes even oppressive and engulfing, that our social scheme is for control and power. And we can't get to that underbelly. It's too protected. And it's often because you didn't feel protected. So we might have to go back and do some psychological educating of our own story to ourselves. Write out your story a bit and try to find those places in which you didn't feel like you were protected. And therefore, the innocence hid in corners and in subterranean regions of your life. I know how scary it can be for an aide to start sharing and being vulnerable and open up. Because you often have also a suspicion and a paranoia about who you'd be opening up to. Can they handle it? What will they do with it? Will they take advantage of me? Will they share it with other people? And you go on protecting others. It's part of the way you eagerly move towards the world. I will protect others, but that's often you not taking care of you. You're using these other people as a way of avoiding you. Now, of course, there's great results from that, but are you using them? And we're all mis mixed motives. Please don't, I mean, like, we should all be helping others. I get it. But are you using them to the neglect of looking at your own shit? Our virtue eights is innocence. And that's what that song is about, being vulnerable, knowing how hard it is to share, but possibly sharing anyway, melting a bit, getting less icy. I know that eights can trust only a few people, but start possibly starting with them. Sharing just a little bit more. This will make you more well-rounded. It'll make you a better leader, guys. And if somebody doesn't perfectly deal with your narrative, you do not have to put them on the shit list. You can help them understand you by helping you them understand how it hurts you that they didn't perfectly handle your story. You guys have to be encouraged towards vulnerability. Trust more people. Err on the side of giving people a chance. I know that's hard for you. Commit to them knowing you. Have the same guts and strength to share and reveal and be transparent as you do to lead and push towards the future. Yeah, I'm poking at you. Have the guts, the cojones, to actually share, to be softer. That's, that's strength. It's not cute as you get older to constantly be a mystery. It's a fucking game you're playing. It's a joke. Let me soften up here a little bit. The end of that song. And I hope you do listen to it. It doesn't need to be like a song you dig. But listen to those lyrics. And at the end of the song, there's a chorus. And as far as I can hear, it's a chorus that is a mixture of children and adults. I feel like kind of uh, the weight of it, even as I'm saying it, the beauty of children and adults singing together. And there's some lyrics that say, well, if it's so deep, you don't think you can speak about it. Don't ever think that you can't change the past and the future. Integrate the child, <laughs> the, the part of your life in which you are running from that feels weak and vulnerable and out of control. Integrate that part. Talk to the kid and help them grow up, age them. There's a certain part of you that's stuck at that age. And so therefore you are not working with all of the operating uh, facilities that you could. What did they need? What did they want? What love did they not get? Okay, 
Here's another Carl Jung quote. I love this quote. He says, I always thought that when I accepted things, they would overpower me in some way. This turns out not to be true at all. And it is only by accepting those things that one can assume an attitude towards them, meaning some kind of maturity towards them, understanding towards them. Being receptive to whatever comes, good or bad, sun and shadow, forever alternating. And also accepting my true nature with its positive and negative sides. What a fool I was. How I tried to force everything to go according to the way I felt it ought to go. Do I have to say more? It's, you get it. Let's move on. So we've kind of talked about how to go internal in a conceptual way, but just practically, let's talk about friends. Let's talk about therapists. Let's talk about people who can actually help and support you. Now, it is always the case that eights are almost the most like, least likely to get therapy. So even doing this right now, I'm probably not going to get a bunch of clients from it. However, I still want to talk about it. Uh, the song that I use is the Beatles classic song with a little help from my friends. And I just want to talk about these lyrics specifically. Okay. I need someone to love. And then the question mark is, could it be anybody? All I need is someone knows just where I'm going. Somebody who knows just what I'll show them. Okay. The reason I love this lyric is because it's such an eight lyric. Be in line with me. Here's a quote from John Steinbeck. Most people have two balls, but there are few who have one, and even fewer who have three. Those are the eights. Women, men, theys, thems, y'all got three balls, and you use them quite effectively. You're very direct. You're truth tellers. Uh, you know what you want and how to get it, and if you don't know how to do it, you'll find out how to do it. Okay, you need to have strong people around you just do. The clients who are eights that usually find me, find me for a reason. I tend to have some strength in the room and we'll go into that in a minute. But even with therapists, they need to find strong therapists, not people they could push over. So you guys are attracted to people who don't bullshit and you need them in your life, not just to do your bidding, but to get some feedback from them. So because you're so externally motivated to go internal, you need to often get pushed back. You suffer from a lack of self-reflection. I'm sorry, unless you've done a lot of work in your life. If you're new to dealing with the internal part of your world, um, you the, the gravitational pull that you have is towards the future, not towards the past or the now. It's hard work to do. So you don't have a sense of your limitations at times. And this is, as we've talked about before, why your bodies can break down so quickly. So a good eight will have a team around them, friends around them, lovers around them, coworkers around them, that have a strong enough voice to push back and that you respect enough to hear that. You can confuse vulnerability with weakness. But it is not weak to ask for help. And it is not weak to be patient with people as they express to you what they're seeing. It's a vulnerable position to be in, but it's a place of strength so that you don't burn out. And will they have the three balls to call you out? You guys like some friction, so this is where you can get some friction. And, and in that, you will have to giveth a little bit and taketh a little bit of what they are giving. How are you doing, they might ask. Well, here's what happens when I talk to eights who aren't really self-reflective, especially social eights I experience as this, because they're a bit more gregarious and they're in environments where they don't want to be looked at as weak to the group. 
and I have some friends that haven't done it much work on themselves and I'll say, yeah, how are you doing? And, and I regret asking because it lacks authenticity. This is the answer I get back from a couple people. I never had a bad day in my life. All right, how are you doing? You already know, always thriving. And I was just like, I make the mistake of always asking them. I hate that I ask them because it's the same fucking answer. Now, with therapy, I gotta go into this. They are likely the least um, apt to be in therapy. Sevens also have a tough time with that. And they often have to have gotten their ass totally handed to them in life to become interested in being self-reflective because the weight of the pain is so big. Additionally, AIDS won't give therapists a chance sometimes. Now, I admit, I did a, uh, a piece, and maybe you can find it if you are follow me on Instagram. I did a piece for a men's mental health app about therapists. And essentially I say that out of the 100% of therapists, 5 to 1% are unicorns. You know, 20% are good. Um, there's a mediocre, mediocre character uh, category. There's getting the job done, and then there's shitty. Like, you just, you shouldn't be doing this at all. Eights want the unicorn, and I understand that. You need to go hunt for that. But there are some that would do you well that you would disregard because... They do one thing wrong. But granted, find the strong, powerful in the room presence that you can know that they have command and gravitas to match your strength. They might not be an eight. Like, I'm a sexual four. I look a lot like an eight, but I have a much more emotional range than you. Sorry. I just do. I can go to dark fucking places. I can look at the ugliest things in my own life and other people's lives. And that's where I can carry a lot of weight. I can be very present. I can look at the past ugly stuff. And I can also look at the future a bit with you. And so you need a therapist like that if you're going to look for a therapist. Maybe somebody who has some love for intensity also. Um, I asked one of my clients who is a sexual eight. So like a really intense eight. Who had a lot of paranoia when they came in. Um a lot of mistrust. And so I asked him, he's a corporate guy, and he'll appreciate that I'm giving him a shout out, and he would never want me to actually verbally shout out his name because he's an eight, and he's gonna hide from actually being open to the vulnerability. And But he's getting better. He's getting better. He's sharing that he's in therapy with people. It's great. I asked him, like, what are you looking for a therapist when you started looking for a therapist? And, you know, what have you experienced with me? And because he knows... In his own lives, when he has friends that are eights, how he would guide them. And this is what he said. I'm looking for a badass, intense. A sh uh, they have a shell with a soft core. So he even wants a, a therapist with a shell with a soft core. Someone who can accept to work with a client who will not trust them for a long time before eventually opening up and accepting their uh, guidance. A therapist who can punch back after challenging and is not afraid to offer direct feedback here and there. Someone fun who helps remove the stigma and shame about therapy. That's been my, my experience with you eights as a therapist. That's what my eights are looking for. So if it isn't somebody like me, go try to find that person. Usually you can feel it pretty quick in the room or in a call as you're investigating. I like to say this. This is my favorite quote probably in therapy and this is important to you guys. The importance of having a tail. Okay. I once was told if five people tell you you have a tail, you better turn around and see if you have a tail. This is a consensus taking issue. So we're talking about friends. We're talking about having friends that are powerful enough to push you back. Therapist, power enough to push you back. Coach, whatever. 
if five people told you you have an issue, you're too uh, gruff, you're too engulfing, you're too um, spitfire, there's too much. Well, eights get told that all the time. But if you ask five people, am I too much in this area? And all five people say yes, you better turn around and see if you have a tail. That's the idea. If one person says you're too much and you go ask five other people and one, one more says maybe, but the other four are like, we can handle it. Well, then you don't have to look at that issue or you don't have to give it the same energy. So have people who can call you out, but don't make them codependent. Don't take on weak people who are just going to want to serve you. I'm talking about real call out that is, is, is actually heavy and is hard to hear. People who could stand up to you that you respect, that are direct also, maybe direct in a different way than you. Because if you want to be strong in a healthy way, you need to get that feedback. You need to see what's hiding in the crooks and the corners. And there's certain stuff you could just never see because you're in your own body. You already have difficulty hearing back, uh, hearing feedback because you're a person who pushes ahead. This is a good exercise for you. Of course, you don't want to also look for those people who are going to blame you for being too strong. I get that. The weak are going to be not in your inner circle usually. So, this is a act of one a couple close people but two that other act of consensus taking do i have a tail somebody gives you feedback and you wonder hmm could this be experienced by everybody and maybe i'm missing something maybe i have to soften maybe i have to go to a different gradation of color from crimson to something a little bit more in the pink hues well, you might get that from asking a number of people. And if they all say you have a tail, you better turn around and see if you have a tail. All right. So that is a little help from our friends and our leaders. And I know you guys are good at being led if you respect the leader in charge. So find those people and let them push back on you so you do not burn out and die out. All right. All right, guys, thank you for joining me on this deep dive. I know it was a long one. Maybe you watched it in parts. Uh, I hope that you gain something from it and know yourself a little bit better. Please subscribe if you can. It's cool to just have people who are going to be uh, catching up with the Enneagram and staying engaged. Like I said, if you need to reach out for any help, do so. And uh, my socials and my website will come up. Otherwise, I've so appreciated this time. And as I say at the end of all of my video videos, in the words of Rainar Marie Rilke, everything is yet to be done. Everything. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.